who can deliver the journalism we need in the digital public square? Well, first, I'm going to start by talking about the idea of, the, of there having been a golden age of journalism. Um, there was one. It was rather short-lived on the scale of national history. Not everything that glittered was gold. And except at the heights, it's over. And so is the role, at least so far, of the, is the role of news in everyday life as Americans live it. Per capita reading of American newspapers, you remember American newspapers, per capita reading has actually been in decline for at least three decades. It was already slumping long before the internet came along. And the decline is even more pronounced if we take into account the statistics on how much time people take with a newspaper or a magazine or surrogate, whether on dead trees or online. Regardless of whether people tell pollsters that they keep up with the news, it's more that they're somewhat in touch with some of the bigger headlines than that they get their minds around the most consequential stories. Now, the model on which the United States was founded, the small r Republican model of governance, presupposes that there is some critical mass of citizens, white males anyway, originally, who spend a critical mass of their time ascertaining what is what in the public sphere and forming political judgments accordingly. This is necessary for self-governance. And it was to suit this model of public life that the new American Republic set up one of its most revolutionary initiatives, that humble entity known as the U.S. Post Office, one of the very first achievements of the federal system, and the reason it's central to the subsequent history of the public square in, in America is that it subsidized the printing and distribution of newspapers. Otherwise, it would have been economically unfeasible. So to the extent that it becomes more difficult for people to know what's going on in the world, to that extent, the enlightenment premise of the relation between knowledge and power breaks down. You shall not know the truth, and your ignorance shall not make you free. Did the Golden Age then begin with the founding of the American Republic? The evidence suggests not. Many of us have quoted, I'm sure I've done it myself, a remark committed by Thomas Jefferson in 1787. And I quote, if it were left to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate for a moment to prefer the latter. But the press's cheerful self-congratulation is, and already was actually, or was already on its way to becoming a rampant simplification. And so is the notion that the press protected by the First Amendment was a mannerly, balanced, objective press. The press whose free freedom was guaranteed by the First Amendment was rather unbridled, opinionated, scurrilous, vicious, and flagrantly partisan. And a somewhat older Jefferson, uh, 20 years later, as president, with much more experience under his belt, said something quite different. He, he then said, in a passage that's generally not quoted so often, and certainly not in newspapers, he wrote, the man who never looks into a newspaper is better informed than he who reads them, inasmuch as he who knows nothing is nearer to truth than he whose mind is filled with falsehoods and errors. No golden age there. Typical of the journalism of the early decades of the Republic was the combat between the press, the presses of 1828, a very much partisan press, when the, the papers that supported Andrew Jackson for president drummed up a campaign clam, claim that John Quincy Adams, his principal opponent, while serving as ambassador to Russia, had procured an underage American girl for the czar. That was their election campaign issue. While the pro-Adams papers were obsessed with the claim that Jackson's wife was a bigamist, having still been married to her first husband at the time of her wedding with Jackson. As it happens, that one was true. The consequence of this election was momentous in American hi history. It uh, certainly was momentous for the Native Americans of the Southeast, whom Jackson drove over the Mississippi River. But the issue of Indian removal, as it was called, 
did not loom large in the press. They were more concerned with the sexual lives of the candidates and their spouses. If there was a golden age for the American press, when dots got connected and the biggest stories got told, it fell actually during the first, during the two decades, roughly 1954 to 1974. For much of this period, total per capita daily newspaper circulation was actually rising, even as smaller newspapers were closing, especially afternoon papers, and television was scooping up eyeballs and eardrums. Leaving aside local variations, the press's claim to a significant role in America's national democratic life during the years following World War II rests heavily on its having helped, down, helped bring down the demagogue Joseph McCarthy and two presidents as well, Linda Johnson and Richard Nixon, as well as spurring a virtual revolution in civil rights. Those were the golden years. In civil rights, mainstream journalism's achievement is best appreciated and against the background of the not so benign neglect that newspapers practice for decades uh, in the face of the wretched conditions of African Americans, South and North. In 1938, according to our historians, uh, journalist historians, Gene Roberts and mm -hmm. Hank Klebanoff, whose book, uh, The Race Beat, I recommend very highly, and I quote from them, no major publication had a news bureau in the South. Even so thorough a paper as the New York Times wrote about anti-segregationist leaders and organizations almost entirely on the inside pages when it reported on them at all, close quote. Not until 1947 was the first major national bureau established in the South, and that was a New York Times bureau in Chattanooga, which was the hometown of the family that owned the company. The Times in general during these years was emphasizing stories of incremental progress, and their conception of objectivity downplayed the steadfast nonviolence of the demonstrators by featuring demonstrations, by featuring collisions with violent police as uh, as a violent clashes rather than emphasizing the nonviolence of the demonstrators. The wire services focused also on violent confrontations but avoided blaming whites for them. Still, mounting coverage of civil rights actions by the New York Times and other outlets incurred the wrath of segregationists. During uh, the early 1960s, civil rights coverage improved in both quantity and quality. Northern newspapers played up the brutality of white supremacists. News photos, like especially those I think were marking the 50th anniversary this week of the demonstrations in Birmingham, Alabama. You're familiar, I, I think, with the pictures of the police dogs and the high pressure of the fire hoses and so on. Those pictures were everywhere, uh, and they were electrifying. So in this sort of mel melodramatic scenario, television cover coverage of the civil rights confrontations succeeded in casting the movement as the uh, good guys versus the riotous racists and barbarian police in a national melodrama. And that coverage galvanized the movement, spreading its iconography and its appeal to potential supporters, intensifying the public impression of a polarization between good and evil. I remember vividly during that week, I didn't own a television, I was a student in college, but I remember going to somebody's room, I think there was one television on the corridor to watch the 15 minute news, that's what we had then in 1963, and uh, being uh, startled and uh, galvanized by these images of the police dogs in uh, Birmingham. Once amplified, the violence of white supremacists over time isolated them and served the cause of reform. The immediacy of the pictures electrified a critical mass of viewers like me. About the Vietnam War, there's a received narrative about the place of journalism in that history, and it emphasizes journalistic dissent from the government line. It, however, neglects the manifold ways in which conventional journalism deferred uh, quite uh, routinely to the official government position, so much so as to read like a sheaf of Pentagon press releases. If you look, for example, at the coverage of the Tonkin Gulf incident in August 1964, this was the uh, this was a, a shooting incident uh, off the coast of North Vietnam. 
uh, in which the uh, Pentagon and White House claim was that uh, American gunboats had been fired upon unprovoked by North Vietnamese gunboats. Um, and it was this incident, or actually two, two days of it, uh, which led to Johnson bringing before Congress the so-called Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, uh, which served as the legal justification for the subsequent uh, 12 years of war, uh, passing uh, unanimously in the House and with two dissents in the U.S. Senate. But if you look at the, uh, if you look at the coverage, uh, for example, in the New York Times, our best newspaper, of the Tonkin Gulf incident, and I, I can show it to you, some of you if you're interested, I have it. Um, the uh, front page articles quote only uh, source, the only sources they quote are from the White House, the Pentagon, and State Department officials. The sole other source mentioned in any of these front page articles shows up in the 20th paragraph of one piece with Senator Richard Russell, who was then a powerhouse on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, suggesting that the North Vietnamese might have been confused because there had been some South Vietnamese naval activity in the Gulf of Tonkin. We know now from uh, the official history compiled by the Pentagon and the National Security Agency that the American uh, ships uh, were gathering signal intelligence. They were accompanying the South Vietnamese ships who were uh, organizing hit and run raids on North Vietnam. Uh, and the American boats were actually there escorting them. One of the incidents almost certainly did not even take place. So zero for journalism in this case. Um, during this period also, uh, not well known, um, it, uh, but I was once informed by a Pentagon uh, public relations person that NBC even asked the, the Pentagon to institute censorship. They, they were uh, uncomfortable at actually having to guess where the line of unprintability or un, undisclosability was, and they wanted help from the government, which did not comply. The press's liberating role did come, but it came slowly. And what happened was that reporters, good reporters' view on the ground over time collided with the official line. So as the news coverage mounted, it had more news about failure. Uh, and the impression grew that the war was a difficult slog and that victory was indefinitely postponed. But even here, it's interesting to note that public opinion actually changed on the war before the general press coverage did. It's a long story, which I won't take the time with here. But suffice to say that the Tet Offensive of early 1968, which startled both journalists and the government, turned uh, attention to the falsity of U.S. government claims about how well the war was doing. And then Seymour Hersh's 1969 report, uh, reportage on war crimes in Milai, the village of Milai, where hundreds of civilians were slaughtered by American troops, was uh, planted with a tiny news service, quite marginal alternative, as we would say today, uh, but did then pour into the mainstream press. Likewise, one of the most consequential um, waves of the war was the unacknowledged bombing um, uh, by the U.S. forces of Cambodia and Laos uh, beginning in 1968-69. And you would not have learned of this, uh, especially in 69 after President Nixon uh, came to office. You would not have learned of this uh, uh, on television, and you would barely have learned on it. Um, in newspapers. Even remarkable feats of reporting didn't make many waves. This so-called secret bombing of Cambodia, which of course was secret from Americans, not from Cambodians, was, was reported on page one of the New York Times on May 9th, 1969, and nobody followed up uh, in an appearance. The reporter, William Beecher, appeared some years ago at Harvard and said that he expected that uh, this would make a lot of waves, the story, and it didn't. Nobody cared. The press did not lead with that big truth. Um, as for the crimes, or I should say the other crimes, of the Nixon administration, the Washington Post's intense investigation of that whole constellation of criminality known as Watergate was supplemented at times by other newspapers and occasionally well summarized on television news, and it's probably the most successful muckraking episode ever. It's certainly the most celebrated, and for good reason for it exemplifies journalism stepping up to compensate for the political system's inability to cope 
with the executive's abuse of power. Note, most of the revelations reported by Woodward and Bernstein originated with government leaks, the famous Deep Throat, among others, and the investigations by Judge John Sirica. So journalism, the ability of journalism to do its job rested on its ability to channel contrary information from government agencies. Uh, but it was truly Woodward and Bernstein's bold, dogged, and protracted pursuit of the crimes into the White House that woke up the watchdog. And unsurprisingly, the people who did this reporting, Woodward uh, uh, and Bernstein, were not inside dopester political reporters. They were not White House correspondents. Woodward was a crime reporter. Uh, Bernstein was a general assignment reporter. They partnered to work, as we would say later, outside the box. They were not boxed in by their own institutions. So Nixon's resignation in 1974 confirmed the view of the rebels of the 1960s that journalism was a high calling, even or especially when publishers tried to dampen the zeal of their employees. And this is when students went flocking to journalism school, and journalism for a while was glamorous. But after Watergate, the hard, in my view, the hard won fierce, truth-bound independence of the mainstream press failed to hold. Under pressure to compensate for the ample weaknesses of the American political system, journalism crumpled. Why? Credulity. Cost-cutting to the bone for the sake of the bottom lines of top conglomerates. Bigfoot reporters, as they call them in, in the business, they sort of the big name people, uh, became, as, as my late friend Jack Newfield, the Village Voice, once said, uh, stenographers with amnesia. That was sort of the ideal for journalism. But I'm going to skip forward to the 21st century, uh, where I can sum up the failures so far uh, with, uh, with one, two, three, four, five words. Uh, number one, would, and I won't go into detail on all of them. Number one is Florida 2000. Um, number two is Iraq, when most Washington journalism collapsed into deference as George W. Bush bulldozed the United States into war. Number three, financial, for the bubble, when business journalism played cheerleader and pedestal builder for the titans of finance as they erected a fantastical tower of derivatives which grew way too tall to fail without wrecking the global economy. And throughout this period, uh, and continuing the story with a million bad actors and endless newsworthy consequences, climate change. About the Republican seizure of power in 2000, I would recall for you simply that major American media from election night on treated George W. Bush as the presumptive winner in Florida and therefore in the Electoral College and framed the unfolding problem as the question of why Al Gore didn't hurry up and acknowledge his defeat. Fox News led the way on election night, you might recall, declaring Bush the winner with a report by John Ellis, the cousin of young Bush. Tim Russert, among others, followed up by proposing on all his outlets that Al Gore be a gent and concede. About American news credulity in the run-up to the Iraq War, very much has been written, but it's, it may be worth wearying you just a tiny bit by reminding you that 100,000 or more Iraqi civilians died in that war, as well as more than 4,400 Americans. There have also been there more than 32,000 American wounded, of whom a significant number suffered brain injuries. Now, it must be said that there were news organizations in the run-up to the war that saw through the, the Bush administration's breathless hype, the one who wins uh, the, the, the award uh, but not so much as to have been able to stay in business, was Knight Ritter. They did have a golden age then. But America's most influential newspapers, the New York Times and the Washington Post, bent over backwards to prove that they were on the Bush White House's team, as they did admit later, too late. On Bush's claims about uh, so-called weapons of mass destruction, the general tone of much of the reporting uh, was sort of something like this. He said, she said, but mostly he said, and by the way, she said the opposite, and people in the know think she doesn't know what she's talking about. Judith Miller, one of the prime villains of this story, uh, famously, um, well, I'll, I'll get to what she said herself about her reporting, 
Um, she was uh, one of the prime uh, movers in New York Times coverage during the uh, period between September 11th, 2001, and the declara and the the launching of the war. She said later, and I quote her: "My job was not to collect information and analyze it independently as an intelligence agency." My job was to tell readers of the New York Times as best as I could figure out what people inside the governments, she means the U.S. and U.K., who had very high security clearances, who were not supposed to talk to me, were saying to one another about what they thought Iraq had and did not have in the area of weapons of mass destruction. And when the Times published its own uh, long overdue self-study in October of that year, she was quoted as saying, WMD, I got it. It, totally wrong. The analysts, the experts, and the journalists who covered them, we were all wrong. If your sources are wrong, you are wrong." Close quote. But sources like weapons of mass destruction do not grow on trees, nor do they swim up to the journalists and attach themselves to them like barnacles. The journalist chooses them, and I would argue that the journalism collectively still um, doesn't understand its part. Um, in those choices. Let me pass over briefly to the breathlessness with which financial journalism treated the market thrills that led to the 2007-2008 crash. By, he, by the market thrills, I, I, I'm throwing together a whole bunch of related phenomena, the financialization of the global economy, the metastasis of derivatives as the uh, core of holdings by banks. Uh, the mergers of commercial banks, investment banks, and insurance companies, um, the latter of which in particular came about as the direct result of deregulation which had been underway since the late 1970s and culminated in the 1999 law, uh, the so-called Graham-Leach-Bliley law signed by President Clinton, uh, which repealed the 1933 Glass-Steagall Act, one of the p milestone legislation uh, elements of the New Deal and permitted bank mergers into too, too, big to, too big to fail corporations, houses of cards piled high with the potential of collapse. I looked through the, uh, the, the, the prime database of American newspaper coverage during that period. During the entire year 1999, when this bill was going through hearings in Congress, uh, eventually being passed and then signed by President Clinton, I found a grand total of two newspaper articles, two, which warned that the repeal of Glass-Steagall Steagall was mistaken. Um, one of them appeared in the Bangor Daily New News of Maine and the other in the St. Petersburg Times of Florida, two. The New York Times uh, economics columnist, one of our best, David Leonhardt, who's now the uh, head of the uh, Washington Bureau, wrote after the implosion, uh, about Wall Street and the Bush administration and Alan Greenspan's Federal Reserve, who's, quoting him here, near religious belief in the powers of the market led them to conclude that the mere fact that a company was willing to make an investment made that investment okay. But Leonhardt was writing this after the bubble had burst and the global financial system had seized up and frozen. Derivatives, he wrote afterward, were being praised as a boon that would make the economy more stable praised by no less than the grand Yoda of American quotables, Alan Greenspan. Uh, Leonhardt also went on to say in this article that a, a milestone in the deregulation effort came in the fall of 2000, this was a year after the repeal of Glass-Steagall, when a lame duck session of Congress passed a little noticed piece of legislation called the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. Little noticed indeed. I looked in the database, I found not a single substantive mention of this law in any American newspaper, not one. Take the exotic derivatives called collateralized debt obligations, among the principal cards with which the whole international financial house was built. These multiplied from an estimated $20 billion in the first quarter of 2004 to over $180 billion by the first quarter of 2007. They were mentioned by the New York Times' excellent Floyd Norris in a 2001 article on the front page of the business section, a piece about American Express, headlined, they sold the derivative, but they didn't understand it. And from then on, no substantial Times front page business section article so much as mentioned collateralized debt obligations for almost four years.
Uh, my colleague, Dean Starkman, who himself was a staff writer at the Wall Street Journal uh, and later on contract to the Washington Post covering white collar prime, crime, researched and wrote an article in the Columbia Journalism Review subsequently. He looked at the nine most influential business press outlets from January 1st, 2000 through June 30th, 2007. He, that period designed to cover the entire housing bubble. Um, he found a total of 730 articles that contained what he judges to be significant warnings that the bubble might burst, 730 out of something more than 1 million. So the business press failed and failed and failed again. It failed to make clear that the flagrantly abusive part of the mortgage industry, the so-called subprime sector, had become well integrated into the legitimate part, ordinary banking. The financial press had become a marketing apparatus for the reputation of the industry and its leadership. A culture of celebrity enve enveloped the big names of finance. The CEOs of major banks, Wolf Street investors, operators of hedge funds, these were, all after, uh, these were after all not just tycoons but philanthropists. Their names were engraved in the walls of university buildings, museums, symphony halls, and opera houses. They were, in those years, in the eyes of media executives who convey status upon those they single out for attention, bringers of cultivation. They were wise men. Students who envied their fortunes admired these men. In an all-enveloping cultural atmosphere, they were held to be not only creators of wealth, but moral exemplars. Indeed, moral exemplars because they were creators of wealth. And last, but in the, not in the slightest least, our journalism is barely, finally, coming around to treating the convulsive climate change of our time as at, at, at least an intermittent story. Uh, when Stevenson, formerly uh, the editor of the Ideas section of the Boston Globe and a writer for The Atlantic and a commentator on public radio, pointed out in a striking piece online a few weeks ago, um, that, that climate change, even when, it, when it's treated now, is not treated so much as urgent, is frequently covered as a topic for special interests, a problem, not an existential threat. And he pointed out that our gasping journalism does not flood the zone. I should add, I have to add uh, with, with great regret that his piece, which I recommend to all of you, appeared on the online uh, site of the Boston Phoenix, which subsequently has folded. That, that happened in just this last November. So um, our, our gasping journalism bends over backward still to prove it is not biased, not biased toward sphere earthers as opposed to flat earthers, that is. Fastidiously, it clutches the rituals of detachment. Two British scholars who, um, who studied climate coverage surveyed 636 articles from four top American newspapers between 1988 and 2002, and found that most of them gave as much attention to the tiny group of climate change doubters as to the consensus of scientists. And as for op-ed pieces, they were skewed the same way, and I quote from this study, of the 2,166 opinion pieces on climate change published in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and Houston Chronicle between 1990 and 2009, 20% disagreed with the scientific consensus on climate change. As for television news, Despite the record temperatures of 2012, the hurricanes, droughts, wildfires, and other violent weather events, and the greatest meltdown of Greenland ice in recorded history, television news went dumb and mute. Take the Sunday talk shows, which are supposed to give us long views, long chews, not just sound bites. These uh, high-minded talking head episodes that set a lot of the agenda in Washington and for the attuned public. They have been otherwise occupied. All last year, according to the liberal research group Media Matters, and I quote from their report that just came out recently on this, the Sunday shows spent less than eight minutes on climate change in 2012. ABC's This Week covered it the most at just over five minutes. NBC's Meet the Press covered it the least in just one six-second mention. Most of the politicians quoted were Republican presidential candidates, including Rick Santorum, who went unchallenged when he called global warming junk science on ABC's This Week. 
More than half of climate mentions on the Sunday shows, that, that grand total of eight minutes, um, consisted of Republicans criticizing those who support efforts to address climate change. And here's the real kicker. In four years, still quoting, Sunday shows have not quoted a single scientist on climate change. So what's going on here? And where does this point us and what can we do? So news, in my view, like the rest of entertainment, plays on and plays with emotions. What it creates are sensations. This is what is held to be the way to secure the attention of eyeballs and eardrums. So it is that as the aforementioned, the authors of the article I mentioned wrote and many others have pointed out, journalists are prisoners of their norms, that is, their biases. The newsworthy event must be dramatic. Preferably, it should feature newsworthy persons. It must, in principle, be new, except when it's too new, and then it's incomprehensible. Once it's admitted to what my colleague Dan Hallen uh, has called the sphere of legitimate controversy, then it should be treated, but it should be treated with balance, as in some say the Earth is spherical, some say it's round. I'm sorry, flat. Now, norms can be bent. Um, in Bloomberg Business Week, after Hurricane Sandy, uh, had a garish cover headline uh, with a photo of uh, large sections of New York City underwater and the surrounding a uh, area, and, and their headline was, It's Global Warming, Stupid. The writer, Paul M. Barrett, quoted Eric Poulias, a, a senior vice president of the Environmental Defense Fund and former deputy ed editor of Bloomberg Business Week, uh, to this effect, we, cannot, we can't say that steroids caused any one home run by Barry Bonds, but steroids sure helped him hit more and hit them farther. Now we have weather on steroids, and I quote. Um, I guess as long as baseball can supply a metaphor, there's hope for journalism. <laughs> so, uh, now what? Deference to movers and shakers in covering business and government, this is a very long and pretty repetitive story. The reasons are evident. Concentration breeds servility. Highly paid celebrity journalists make careers cuddling up to the powerful. Meantime, the tabloid spirit flourishes, even in the journalism of the mainstream. See Simpson, OJ. Taking their cues from the Drudge Report and other right-wing enterprises, the respectable media fed on frenzy. We heard vastly more about Whitewater than about rising water, incomparably more about Monica Lewinsky than about melting ice caps, more about swift boats than about the ships that now, unobstructed by ice, sail freely across the Arctic. The flagrant partisanship of the 19th century press that I alluded to was resurrected by Drudge and Rush Limbaugh and Rupert Murdoch's apparatus, about which so much could be said. The profusion of delivery systems for information, from talk radio to cable television and then to the internet, left much mainstream news inhaling the tabloid spirit, though at times some of it continued to defend the high moral ground an embattled ideal of objectivity, as growing percentages of Americans gravitated toward either entertainment or ideological confirmation, primarily on the right. Now, I don't have to tell you, I think, that the financial troubles of journalism have done their part to muzzle a watchdog that was already, at crucial moments, snoozing out front anesthetized. Newspaper companies, increasingly under group ownership and beholden to stock market pressures, harvested long profits as long as they could, but increasingly accustomed to a monopoly position in their, in their localities, they failed to anticipate the Internet cutting into their advertising revenue. Dramatically, newspapers lost the profitability of their glory years. Buccaneers with no particular interest in public knowledge, like the Chicago real estate mogul Sam Zell, were able to buy distressed papers like the Los Angeles Times with borrowed money. When ad money hemorrhaged, they saved where they could, and they did that by cutting back coverage and staff. Statehouse coverage languished. It's now 20, 30 percent of what it was just 10 years ago. America's newspaper editorial staff numbers have fallen back to where they were 40 years ago. Investigations have shriveled as the percentage of total households watching any of the three nightly network news 
uh, shows has shrunk by more than half since 1980. Public radio is a bright spot in the media firmament, but as you know, it is embattled, both financially and by the Republican Party, I would add by its own timidity. So here we are in the inauspicious president, present. So now comes the time for a certain um, modest optimism or at least hopefulness about prospects. So Americans are, after all, required to be optimistic or else give up our identity card. So I will do my best. Where mainstream journalism fails, enter imperfect expedience. So in the twilight of newspaper ambition, we enter the age of the database and the age of the sort of para-journalism exemplified by WikiLeaks and the news disseminators of the, new of the Tunisian and Egyptian revolutions, Facebook and Twitter. The big story about the WikiLeaks revelations from Iraq, Afghanistan, and the State Department was the partnership that developed between the para-journalists, the database cultivators, um, and the established media, like the cooperating newspapers, the New York Times, the Guardian, Der Spiegel, Le Monde, and El Pais. As the cost of dumping database databases shrinks to near zero, attuned readers will increasingly pay for the privilege of hosting, selecting, annotating, and framing it, thus the successful business models of the Wall Street Journal the, the Financial Times, and incrementally now the New York Times. But what happens to the general run of the citizens who are not attuned to public affairs and do not particularly want to be? They want to go on about their private affairs, getting a giggle here or there. For most of the last two centuries, the newspaper was the great aggregator, the great bundler. It enticed readers who came to the paper mainly for the crime news, the sensational, the comics, the crossword puzzle, the horoscope, the gossip, and so on. Whatever their motives for coming, the newspaper, that is the paper of news, brushed past them with news. The question for a world of fragmented media, when you can choose not only what to know, thus the daily me formulation, but what not to know, is whether the casual reader, scroller, or surfer will be prepared to slide by even happily without having to be bothered to survey the larger world. The cacophony of devices and channels clamoring for public attention, as I also don't have to tell you, will very likely grow. And if so, I, I, it seems to me self-evident that the gulf between the attuned reader and the know-nothing will also very likely grow. So, this does not mean that a combination of censorship and indifference will bring history to a grinding halt. Unorthodox means for galvanizing publics arise. Um, on, the, on the subject of the vividness and immediacy of news spread by un unorthodox means through social media, I'm sure you've seen uh, the images of the battered face of the Egyptian businessman uh, murdered by the secret police. Uh, Khaled Saeed by name, um, who, uh, whose Facebook page uh, became virally uh, active online, uh, posted on a, face, on, a, on a group page called We Are All Khaled Saeed by a Google executive named Wael Gonim. So this awful image was spread via a technology that was initially developed by a Harvard undergraduate to help him and his friends find dates. Facebook turned out to be as an Egyptian blogger told me when I interviewed him there a couple of years ago, a fantastic way, and I quote from him, a fantastic way to share information or post links or organize events. Because if you can use it to organize a birthday party, then you can use it to organize a demonstration. He adheres to what Harvard's internet guru Ethan Zuckerman calls the cute cat theory. It says that any technology that can be used to p share pictures of cute cats can be used to bring down dictatorships. Caution one, bringing down a dictatorship is not the same as creating a democratic system. Caution two, the pictures themselves did not do the work of human activity. The battered face of Khaled Saeed was not the first such image of atrocity to be posted over the internet during the Mubarak years. The Egyptian police, I was informed, were even in the practice of leaking pictures of their own handiwork, including their own torture sections sessions in order to intimidate. In, the, in this case, the victim was a respectable young businessman, and in the aftermath of the Tunisian revolt, even though only about 5% of Egyptians were using Facebook, uh, 
This was the face that launched a million demonstrators. So we, turn, we return to the doubts of a century ago about the prospects for public intelligence and the burden that has to be placed on the news, however imperfect, however cramped, to take up some of the slack left by our corrupt, self-dealing, short-sighted institutions. That is, once independent citizens have taken the initiative on their own to make their concerns known to a larger public. Our outstanding philosopher of the news, Walter Lippmann, wrote 91 years ago in his great book, Public Opinion, still the best book ever written about journalism in America. And I quote from him, news and truth are not the same thing and must be clearly distinguished. The function of news is to signalize an event. The function of truth is to bring to light the hidden facts, to set them into relation with each other, and make a picture of reality on which men can act." Closing quote. In other words, we would say today, connecting dots. Whether it's about terrorist networks, about derivatives, about banks, or climate change. The press, Lippmann wrote, can fight for the extension of reportable truth. But he was also dead right that the press, and I quote him again, was very much more frail than the democratic theory has as yet admitted. It is too frail to carry the whole burden of popular sovereignty, to supply spontaneously the truth which Democrats hoped was inborn. And when we expect it to supply such a body of truth, we employ a, disleading, a misleading standard of judgment. We misunderstand the limited nature of news, the illimitable complexity of society. We, un we overestimate our, our own endurance, public spirit, and all-around competence. He thought it was foolish to expect the press to create a mystical force called public opinion that will take up the slack in public opinions. Now, Lippmann would agree, I think, that we're not going to get what we need um, given the entanglements and challenges of, of our world by resurrecting the corpse of the journalism that is past or returning to a golden age. The problems require more than restoration of old institutions. We need something quite a bit more than the good old days. A steady light requires connecting dots. This cannot be done by algorithms, algorithms that hype the tiny sensations, that amplify the judgments of giddy, gaga, shallow, deferential, celebrity-sniffing, low-hanging, fruit-picking news organizations. There have to be wise, intelligent, well-educated humans in the control room, humans who are not immune to ideas about what's going on in the world, what needs to be known. Toward that end, we also, I think, need more collaborations among news organizations. Big truth is not only more important than trivia, it's more important than scoops. We need more uh, institutions like ProPublica, which uh, conducts research, which it puts up and then offers to its subscribing uh, entities. One of the best writers in the New York Times now on the post-crash financial system is a ProPublica writer. We need to think ha harder about how to use the digital platforms and social media. We need, I think, the daily we and big data. If we've gotten used to daily weather reports, why don't we have a daily report on the melting of polar ice or the state of potable water, on droughts and floods and hunger? Are we willing to acknowledge that, yes, making the world decent and sustainable is an agenda, and it's better for the news to have an agenda, a <laughs> smart one, than tunnel vision, which leaves the agenda to the blind plutocrats who hold the world hostage? So if I plead for journalism to rise above its badly smudged history, it is only because in a dark time we need light so badly wherever it can be found. Thank you. <laughs>